It's December 13th, 2005. Uh, this is the first interview we're going to be doing in a series of interviews for the Eagleton Institute of Politics uh, Governor's Project. Our first interviewee is Joseph Katz, uh, who was a longtime lobbyist who uh, ran a lobbying firm from 1965, 1993. Does that sound right, Joe? Pretty much. Right. Yeah. And before that, uh, worked uh, uh, for four years, worked uh, in the Hughes administration of Richard Hughes as press secretary, as a publicist. Uh, yeah. Is that fair enough? Uh, I was uh, called special assistant. The press secretary worked uh, under me. And, uh, <laughs> worked under you? I had uh, other responsibilities, too. Such as? Uh, secretary to cabinet and, uh, uh, and uh, I was in charge of speeches and statements beyond uh, just the news really. So a, a lot larger policy. purview than, than simply doing, pre than uh, doing press. Uh, yeah, well, it was governor. a big part of the job, but uh, John Spinelli was my uh, was press secretary and mm -hmm. my associate. Before that, you were a journalist uh, for 10 years with the, uh, the, old Newark, the old Newark Evening News, the old Newark News. I want to just go back a little bit, kind of warm things up and, and talk about your, your educational background because you are a Rutgers graduate as a matter of fact, but you were not a journalism major here, were you? You were a history major. Uh, yes, among other things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I started out to be a journalism major during World War II, and, uh, and then the service, uh, somehow I got into an electronics repair program in the Navy, and uh, people told me that was very valuable and I should follow up on it. So when I was discharged, I came back to Rutgers, and they wouldn't let me into the engineering school. But somebody said, why don't you, uh, you're in a college of arts and sciences, because I've been a journalism major. Why don't you try physics? So I tried it, and boy, what a mistake that was. So uh, in, a, in the middle of my junior year, I switched to uh, history, and I became the oldest reporter on Targum. I, <laughs> and after I graduated, I uh, still thought I'd like journalism. I was also thinking about law school, and I happened to get myself admitted to the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. Was Medill as highly regarded then as it is now? Yeah, I think Medill and Columbia were to talk to. So that's, uh, that all went from there. Were you always coming back to New Jersey after you spent time in Chicago? Not necessarily, uh, but uh, uh, I happened to get a uh, summer uh, a repertorial job on the Newark News in the summer of 1950 the year the Korean War broke out. And uh, so that gave me a, a foothold here. And uh, when, I, when I finished my studies in March of 51, I got an offer to come uh, back to the Newark News at $55 a week. I'd been making 45 in the summer. And so I, I grabbed it. My family lived outside of Newark, and uh, I came back. And, uh, a lot of people had gotten pretty good, pay, well-paying jobs uh, in Buffalo, and sure enough, uh, about a month or two later, I got an offer from the Buffalo Evening News for 75 a week. But at that time, I was settled in New Jersey, and uh, I don't regret it. Were you involved in politics as a reporter, covering politics right from the beginning? No, no, no. Uh, I uh, co uh, they had a system where you covered municipalities. Oh, you covered the local election, but you covered the school boards and you, you covered the, uh, the governing board and the police and, and everything in the town. And uh, uh, my first beat was uh, North Arlington and uh, Lyndhurst, uh, the two towns just above my hometown of Kearney, in southern, and that was in Southern Bergen. Later, I went to Morristown, uh, they reorganized the office there, and they gave me a Sunday column uh, called West to the Gap. Some people called it, uh, well, since we're not going on the air, West to the Crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thought I could write about anything except politics. And uh, so I used to try and scare up a little Sunday feature. I didn't really get into politics until uh, 1953 when they switched me back to... Uh, I started in what, the Carney office, it was a suburban office. That had moved to Clifton to cover a broader area. They switched me back there and assigned me to the Bergen County Courthouse. 
that involved politics. And I was like the third or fourth man following the two top political writers uh, covering uh, the minor Trost election in 53. So I'd get called in to chase around with a candidate on uh, weekends mainly or other times. And I guess I did a creditable enough job and uh, uh, that led to my being assigned to Trenton as the assistant to Jake Martin, Arnold Martin, his name was nickname was Jake, at the beginning of the minor administration and the last couple of weeks of the Driscoll administration in December and January of 53, 54. There were many more daily newspapers, newspapers oh, uh, yeah. in the state at that time. How solid, would you say, if I can use that word, was newspaper coverage of state issues at that time? It, it varied. It was uh, a huge uh, subject for the Newark News. And nowhere near uh, that intense in any other paper. The ledger was a very thin sheet that was barely making it. Uh, what a change time. How, time about, the, has how about the Bergen, uh, the Bergen, the Bergen record, record? was solid and pretty... And, and very thorough on Bergen County politics. Uh, they would send, a, they didn't even have a correspondent for until a few years later, I think, in Trenton. They would send people down on legislative days. And the Patterson at that time had the morning call and then the evening news, and mm. they too probably, what, did they focus on Passaic County issues primarily? Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, they were, well, the Patterson news was heavily involved in politics because its uh, editor and his editor, uh, uh, Abe Green, was a big Republican. He was, his big job was chairman of the Boxing Commission for years. Uh, I mean, and the uh, call, uh, frankly, they were regarded as a bit corrupt. How about the Passaic Herald News? And I mention that only because I remember going back, Bully Schwartz, Bolton Schwartz was Bully a, a Schwartz state was house Bully Schwartz from the Herald News. Sorry about that. The, uh, he was there for forever, way before I was, and uh, they had a presence in Trenton, and they were much more highly regarded than the Patterson papers, even though the editorial policy of the paper, the directors, was very conservative and very Republican, but it was a, a, a an upstanding paper. But Bowley was a feather in their cap. Their 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 base was uh, Passaic and Southern Bergen. Back when I worked in Lyndhurst and North Arlington, uh, that was the, we were competing with the Herald News there. And what was the relationship uh, of reporters like yourself at that time with members of uh, the, of the gubernatorial administrations? Quite close, because there weren't there weren't that many. Uh, 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 Jake Martin was uh, very close to Driscoll uh, way back. I mean, I've been there a while. And I can uh, remember uh, as I was getting ready to come down there full time, I, I was in there on a Saturday. Jake had asked me to come down. I was living up in North Jersey. He asked me to come down and uh, I was actually living in Trenton, I guess. Uh, come down and uh, cover something on a Saturday. And uh, so I'm sitting in the Newark News office, which is uh, right in the center of the State House. There's a men's room there now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, typing my story, and uh, somebody knocks on the back door, and this is 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, so I open the door, and in pops his famous face, <laughs> whom I've <laughs> seen in the papers, uh, Governor Driscoll. Where's Jake? And, uh, oh, Governor, uh, I'm, I'm going to be here working for him. And, uh, was the attitude back then, uh, some people even today look at the press and say they're, uh, they're kind of in bed uh, with government officials. What was the, re again, looking at it from a journalistic perspective, you know, uh, how did you approach what you did down at Trenton? Did you find yourself taking the side of whatever, whichever administration was in power because uh -huh. you knew them, because you might have been friends with them? Well, let's see. In my, in my days in Trenton, I was... Uh, I was I covered only minor because uh, I went to work for the guy that succeeded him, so I didn't have two administrations. I covered the two terms of minor, 
and yes, you got to get his point of view, and uh, you tend, and the press was very forgiving. Uh, the governor had a game he played with us. Uh, he had a switch by uh, when you have his press conferences in that uh, central room of the governor's office. I don't think that's used for press conferences anymore. Uh, uh, I think they're now held out and with chairs and much larger. But about eight or nine of us would sit around this big table, and then he'd, he'd ask him a question. Sometimes he'd he'd switch off uh, the mics. Say, okay, this is uh, not for attribution or off the record. And, talk to you and tell you what a creep that guy was. And, and that, that, that uh, got into your head. I think the incumbent had a big advantage. Of course, it didn't save Bill Cahill uh, later on. Well, we'll talk about that. He had, yeah. he had other problems yeah. outside yeah. his own uh, personal uh, involvement. Yeah. Uh, you were down at Trenton, but then you were moved up to, uh, up to Newark, to the main yes, office, Yes, I was the uh, number two guy, the, uh, the assistant to Jake Morton. Who, who died, he, uh, uh, he was found dead in his hotel room in Chicago. He was out there covering the, uh, the Democratic Convention and he was supposed to go on to San Francisco. And when he didn't show up in San Francisco, they went and found him there. Yeah. How? And, I, uh, and John Davies, who had been the state political writer in Newark, was sent down to take Jake's place running the Trenton office. I would have liked that job, but they decided and I got Davies' job in Newark, which, is turn, as it turned out, was a better deal. Did your perspective change because you, now you used to go down on legislative days, but did your perspective change because you weren't in the mix on a regular basis? I was in the mix. I was on the phone all the time. I was covering state politics. In fact, I was considered the political writer, and that was incidental to the job in Trenton. And uh, so, uh, no, I would write all the political the main political stories, and and uh, John was very protective of his ability to get on page one, so he'd grab as many stories as he could, and there was always a contest between him and me, and between him and other guys. But uh, but I was looked to to write that story and uh, cover, uh, keep an eye on Essex County too. Later, uh, things got pretty bad back in in, in the late '60, early '61. Uh, the new administration and the paper, and I was assigned to the courthouse instead of the city room, and that precipitated my entry into politics. Before we get into that, I want to ask you something about how you described uh, Governor Minor as a caretaker governor. I didn't, but others have. Uh, maybe I did too. I guess you. Uh, yeah, uh, the Republicans like to call him a big spender, Malcolm Forbes, and others. Well, he's very tight. He was tight with the state budget. It was another world. Uh, I remember when uh, the state budget went over a hundred million dollars, and uh, I forget it was maybe that was even during Hughes' administration. We we're so worried about the Newark news headline. Maybe it was. I've lost my perspective on my memory here. Maybe it was a billion dollars under Hughes, but it was some ridiculously low figure in today's terms. We we're so worried about it, and. Uh, Miner never enacted us. We had no sales tax. We had no income tax. It was a different world, uh, financially and otherwise. And the legislature was different. Were, in what way? Well, uh, they had no, uh, always. They had no committee system. Uh, the Re Republican caucus was perhaps the most powerful institution in state government, more so than the governor, even because no bill. Could could move unless it had a majority of the majority in the Senate, and with 21 senators and every rural county having a senator, it was, uh, it was always going to be Republican. And uh, so, if you controlled the caucus, as did Senator Farley from Atlanta County, you were as powerful as the governor. Did Miner used to speak out about? Oh yeah, that? sure. Uh, uh, he did, and uh, um, but it was a, f a great democratic talking point. Let's and the newspapers fulminated against it, and, uh, and but nothing happened. Yeah, and then they, the caucus controlled the whoever was the point nominated. They couldn't get confirmed. 
Still, the Senate still has that power, a black ball power for, by senators. Very powerful inst instrument. Let's talk about your entry uh, into politics. Uh, you have a, a story that I, I've heard or read about, uh, about your departure from the uh, Newark News, that you were, you might say, persona non grata. Well, I became persona non grata the minute I announced I was going to work for a Democrat. But I considered uh, myself uh, let down. Uh, there was a shuffle. There was a new editor, and uh, he, a guy was appointed editor, and he, he had a nervous breakdown. And, and they put Bill Clark in as editor, and he, he had been a very talented, funny political columnist and editorial writer. I don't think he knew one typeface from another when he became editor. And, and uh, for a while, I, he looked to me, because we, we had collaborated on politics. He wrote a politi political column on Saturday and Sunday. He was read by everybody in politics. And then somehow uh, his focus changed, and other people became dominant on the city desk. And they, there was a power struggle there, and I was a victim of it. I got shoved out of state politics, sort of. Until Clark said, why do we miss that story? Why do we miss that Because I can't go to Trenton anymore again. Oh, well, go on, go on down. But by that time, I, I saw that the, there was no place for me. And I had become very friendly with Thorne Lord, uh, covering the uh, Case Lord Senate race in 60. He got whomped. And uh, he came, and Democrats were having all these secret meetings about whom to nominate and and uh, there was this dark horse there were only whispers about, Richard Hughes. It turned out he was going to get it. And Lord was his closest friend and principal backer. And Hughes had what had been a judge. Had been, but he was back in private practice. And he and Lord went way back. I'm sure you know all about that. Like they were law partners. Uh, Lord was United States attorney, and Hughes was his assistant. And, and they both turned Mercer County Democratic. Hughes was followed by Lord. Uh, and uh, so Lord came to me and he said, how would you like to come to work uh, for Dick Hughes? He wasn't an nominee yet. In fact, he had a token primary. I said, yeah, I'd like that. Just like, even, just like that you said, I'd like that? He came to me out of the blue. Yeah, sure. I was looking for a way out. It would be interesting. And uh, we thought he'd be running against Walter Jones, uh, who was the... Senator from Bergen, the leader of this, the largest Republican county in the state. He had a lot of enemies, though, I guess. And then the whole liberal Republican, Wall Street, Broad Street, Newark uh, connection uh, case, uh, Herald Tribune, Newark News, all came together and came up with Eisenhower's former Secretary of Labor, who had been gone back to Macy's, I think, uh, as vice president of personnel after he left Eisenhower, after Eisenhower's administration ended. And he beat Jones in a primary, and uh, he was had all the momentum. As I said to myself, what did I get myself into here? <laughs> I think we could have handled Jones. He's another Paul. But yeah, as, as, you, as you know, and discussed. How involved were Mason. you in the initial Hughes? Pardon? How involved were you in the initial Hughes campaign as a strategist? You were brought on to to handle his media relations, basically. Well, I insisted that I be involved in the policy and strategy because I, I think I knew more about about that than anybody else in there, including Hughes, because he'd been a judge and a lawyer, and they had some smart guys. Uh, uh, John Kervick was there. He'd been state treasurer under money. He knew a lot about stuff. Bob Burkhart, who, who really knew my campaigns, was assistant postmaster general in the Kennedy administration. Later in the campaign, he says, you know, I think I can get Burkhart. Boy, did you get him. <laughs> and he came back and he, he took charge of the campaign. Uh, Tell us about the campaign. Again, this is your first. You, you're kind of on the other side. You yeah, went from I one side the to the other. What was that like? It was interesting. It, it was easier. It was a transition that was easier than I imagined it would have been. Um, I, uh, I had to define what, what we wanted to do, and that was to get uh, our candidate was unknown. In fact, there was a story in Time magazine way into the summer, if not into the fall, 
about this campaign, and the headline was "Who's Use." And uh, so we knew we we had to uh, get him. We we tried every stunt. We we had celebrated his birthday on August eighth uh, or ninth, and, and I arranged for a uh, a party at some motel on Route 27 and in uh, Franklin Park. He happened to be campaigning in Middlesex and Somerset that day. And we wheeled his poor old father up there in a wheelchair to, to uh, the par party. We had a swimming race uh, between them. Between Was this your idea? Years. Yeah, we, we, we brainstormed it. Huh? And uh, <laughs> some fat guy who was a politician from Burlington County. And we, we got pictures taken. We got them in the paper. Uh, you, uh, and we got him. Uh, we got him in the paper negatively because there was a big fight over uh, the anti-bread-based ta uh, tax pledge. And used to his credit, would not. So we're not going to put that pledge in our platform this year. And I knew that would subject him to the Newark News, which hated him because he was running against their candidate, Mitchell. He'd have had a better break from them. Uh, if he'd run against uh, uh, Jones, but Mitchell was—they were—they were used to being the power behind the throne. They ran Essex County, and they uh, wanted to run the state. And under Driscoll, they had a big voice through the Clean Government Republican. That was the name of the organization there, which the Newark News. Dominant. And you de describe, as others have described the Newark News, as uh, words that you don't find uttered in the same breath these days: liberal Republican. Well, yeah, they were liberal on national things, and but on statewide, they were the big voice against the broad-based tax, which liberal Republicans or rational people figured we needed. And we wanted a few, two state, two or three states that had neither a sales nor an income tax. Then this is a big modern industrial state. Did you ever find out why the paper was so vociferously against it? Given its Tradition. politics, well, I didn't have many discussions with the with the uh, with the Scudders. I, I think it was just built into their their uh, genes, the DNA. As I said, <laughs> no, we didn't know about DNA, which we didn't know too much about <laughs> back then. <laughs> uh, and it was a manifestation of their power that they could keep the state from going that way. They weren't all that liberal. Sure, they were liberal on joining the UN, things like that, but. Uh, uh, on, on, on matters that counted, where they were influential, they weren't that liberal. Let's go back talking about uh, Dick Hughes and that campaign. What kind of campaigner was he? Here's someone who had been a judge, had gone back to private practice. Um, had he had any previous campaign experience before? Well, he was the county chairman of Mercer County, who turned it uh, from a Republican stronghold to a Democratic uh, so, bastion. Is that the cliche? Uh, and he'd, he'd run for Congress and. 38 is a 200% Roosevelt Democrat in a bad year for him. And he got whomped by the incumbent. So yeah, he, brought, he, well, he brought political know-how then to, to oh, the campaign. He, he knew everybody in politics. He knew all the, it amazed me. He knew all the politicians down at the local level, all over the state, even though he spent a number of years on the court. But he was back in, uh, he was back in private practice for a few years. Which he went into when he he knew that uh, when Driscoll appointed uh, uh, Bill Brennan to the state Supreme Court, he was knew he wasn't going to get that spot, so he left like I left the North News. And he had there been talk that that Dick yeah, Hughes yeah, would I get understand. the Supreme Court I wasn't around then. Yeah, I think he was ambitious. He was on the appellate division. He was ambitious to uh, go on the Supreme Court. I guess and Brennan did it. Made it quite a name for himself. <laughs> uh, what about the first Q's term? What, what about those first four years that, that sticks out in your mind in terms of what, of what he accomplished? He got a lot reelected. That's a big accomplishment in the face of a tremendous setback in the midterm elections. We tried to finish. He's, he assumed, he uh, pledged that he would not go for a broad-based tax as long as there was any other alternative. So they cooked up an alternative. They were going to mortgage the turnpike. I see that's up again. 
And uh, now they're going to sell it. Before they were just going to mortgage, take the surpluses and turn it into the huge, unbelievable sum of $750 million, which was going to carry us uh, for years. Uh, and, uh, and I cooked up a real fancy press conference to announce it. So it wouldn't break in the morning paper, so the Newark News would have to carry it. And that was the, the afternoon papers were the ones that were read. This was pre-television uh, dependence. And uh, we had a 5 or 6 a.m. press conference to announce it and uh, supplied with, uh, like you guys at Eagleton do every day, we gave the reporters uh, free donuts and bagels. And <laughs> Some things never <laughs> change, do they? <laughs> and, uh, well, and we had a lot of momentum, but it ran out. And we lost uh, the bond issues. We lost the assembly, which we had. And we had to come back from that. And uh, Hughes had a press conference the morning after. And the New York News called on him to resign. Uh, and he said, I'm bloodied, but I'm bowed. And we had to fight our way back to uh, a landslide uh, win. Did you ever think uh, in the midterms that maybe he, there was too much on the plate to deal with, with the bond issues and with the midterm elections coming up, that it, it might have been too, too overwhelming to try to get everything you were after? Well, what was the alternative? We had to try and balance the budget. And, uh, oh, we somehow s balanced the budget after, but we, we uh, uh, in fact, we came out for a... Uh, an income tax after that. We're going to go for a sales tax. And Arthur Sills was the Attorney General. He says, we're Democrats, aren't we? Why are we for a sales tax? Uh, that's regressive. That hurts the poor people. He said, you're right. We didn't get it. But after, uh, uh, after you swept in 65 and we got both houses and we had, had to produce, and the only thing we could get was the sales tax. Let's talk about that 65 campaign. And uh, for people who remember back though, there's a name that sticks out, uh, and that's Eugene Genovese, who was a, uh, a Rutgers professor at that time. Tell, talk a little bit about the, the Genovese impact on the campaign uh, with Wayne Dumont, who was the Republican challenger, and the incumbent Dick Hughes. Well, the Genovese issue got a lot, uh, a lot of late publicity. But uh, I'm going to speak now from hindsight. We later found out it was about a wash. About 3 or 4% voted against this, and 3 or 4% voted for us on that. So we didn't know that. <laughs> we, thought, we thought it was going to blow the campaign. We were all, we were all shell-shocked by Joe McCarthy, at Jenner, and all the Red Hunters from the 50s. And... Uh, the Genovese thing sort of sneaked up. Uh, I was, uh, I used to get uh, look through all of Hughes's mail, and I was getting a, a lot of mail from veterans groups. Let me just break in and just for clarify for people who might not be familiar, that Genovese was a history professor at Rutgers who supported the, uh, the came out at Rutgers at a teaching and said he supported the Viet Cong. He said, "I pray for a Viet Cong victory." I think. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Something you. Go like right that. In. I don't know if those are the exact words. And I, we kept getting mail. Uh, uh, this, this guy should be fired. You're the governor of State University. And it kept mounting. And, and I, I was pretty shaky about it. because. And uh, this is after we'd established the parameters of the campaign, though. We, we uh, had a, a slogan that everybody has used it since. Because he cares. And uh, that fitted Hughes' personality. You know, he's a kindly sort of guy. And he's friendly and genuinely appealing to the average person. And to the captains of industry, to everybody. He was a good guy. And, uh, and it played on it. Uh, 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 some guy was a publicist in South Jersey. I have to give him credit. I don't know if he's still around. A guy named Bernie Popick came to me with this idea of, uh, of a whole campaign with a billboard, because he cares, New Jersey's roads grew by so much. Because he cares, the economy went from so and so. And we started that, and finally we got the idea, forget about the statistics, just because he cares, re-elect Governor Hughes. 
That's what won the campaign. It wasn't Genovese. But all right, Genovese uh, attracted a lot of interest. At first, every letter I got, I sent to Charlie Sullivan, who was our former mayor of East Brunswick, who was dire director of purchase and property, big Middlesex Democrat, who was also the past president of the AMVETS or some big veterans group. Charlie, take care of this. <laughs> we got big, and then Dumont latched onto it. And uh, and we've had a big emergency meeting at the Stockton Hotel in uh, in uh, Seagirt, where going back, Jim Mitchell has spent most of the '61 campaign with his broken leg. Uh, and we had a press conference. The news went out front, and uh, we decided he was going to stand up for the right of. Uh, of expression by uh, freedom of expression in our How university. tough of an argument did you have to make or those easy. who supported that? Or was Dick Hughes supportive right from the get-go? Pretty much. He was a little cautious. But then he went out and he went way beyond what we, <laughs> we expected him to say. And I'm pulling my hair out. <laughs> I smell, I feel the stink of McCarthyism here <laughs> or something like that. Uh, I said, why do you have to bring him into it? Because M McCarthy had cost us a Senate seat. Uh, the, the Clifford Case's first election, 54. Uh, we got all involved with, Mac with uh, a smear of Case's sister by McCarthy. And the sympathy vote elected Case over Charlie Howell, who should have won that election. Did Governor Hughes ever tell you why he decided to take that extra step or two he steps? That's the process. It's the impulse. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's naturally a civil libertarian. A, 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 a Never expressed any regrets? No. I said, why'd you do that, Governor? You made my job a lot harder. He <laughs> didn't. And it, 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 it roused people. He had a better sense of that than anybody. And on the other and side... that's why all the liberals rejoiced in everything. But in the long run, as you said, it really didn't, it was a wash. It was a wash. It was, and meanwhile, the Republican challenger, Wayne, Senator Wayne Dumont, uh, that was what he built his campaign around. Uh, to a great degree, the other stuff was, you know, Dumont was an honest man in, in a lot of ways. Uh, he was uh, for a broad-based tax. It was not an issue. He was he's for a sales tax. He was a conservative Republican. But... Uh, yeah, I guess he did, mostly. It's just like uh, Forrester in this election built his campaign on uh, uh, Corzine's uh, wife's statement. But I don't know that that had an impact either way. Uh, I, uh, in fact, uh, I had the same feeling in this last campaign, just as an old observer, that was going to be a big issue, just like I was afraid of Genovese. But in neither case was it. You worked uh, after the uh, the first Hughes campaign, first term. You worked on the second campaign. Oh yeah, I was in charge of uh, issues and everything. But like then that. you left. Sure, I could read the Constitution. He couldn't run again, and I had a. By that time, I had a two two children. Third one on the way. Very close. He was born in March of sixty. No, what am I saying? This was in. I I had a. Sixty-five. I had four children. Uh, <laughs> first time, right? Uh, uh, I had four children, and I decided I'd go out. And as the governor said to me when I told him I was leaving, then they're going to go to the flesh pots. I said, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> your background. Well, your background was was kind of broad in the sense that you not only did publicity, but you were a political strategist, you worked yeah. on policy. Where did you see yourself fitting in? Well, I had very little to do with the legislature. Occasionally I'd have a, uh, I'd have a, he'd send me on a mission and go whisper something to Hap Farley or do this or that. But the main liaison with the legislature was always his legal counsel. And, uh, so I didn't imagine myself as being a lobbyist or doing much with the legislature. I knew the legislators. I thought I'd be a publicist for people that needed a... I knew all the the press in the state pretty well, and they knew me. 
And I knew state government. I knew a lot of issues down here. So I, th I figured I'd set up, uh, one of my predecessors on the Newark News, Bill O'Connor, had set up a business as a PR man in Newark, which was the business capital of the state back in this early, in the 50s then. In the 60s it still was. It was waning. But I, I figured I would start in Trenton because I was living there and there was a bigger concentration of, uh, of uh, press in Trenton than anywhere else. By that time, uh, the Bergen Record and the other papers all had their representatives and television would come down there more readily. And I didn't think much of television as, uh, as a medium for getting any messages out that I would. But if it was there, any had to be a better chance. So I envisioned myself doing that kind of stuff that I'd done for years, uh, getting his message out. Now, but people came to me uh, early on. They wanted me, after six or seven months, wanted me to pass bills for him and things like that. If you look at what you did over your 30 years in the lobbying business, what did you do in 1993 when you stopped that you didn't do in 1965 when you started? In other words, how, is the, how has the lobbyist profession, the lobbying profession evolved? Over well, I think the biggest change was the committee system had developed somewhere along the line. I, uh, once, uh, of course, the legislature had started changing in the 60s to one man, one vote. And they did away with the, uh, oh, yeah, the 67 Constitutional Convention. And that led to the committee system. And uh, you then had to prepare, uh, you, you had to change your strategy because you had to get stuff through the committees or stop bills. A big part of lobbying is stopping things. And committee, which you, you had, so it made it easier. You had more barriers. It's always been easier to stop a bill than pass one because it's, uh, the, the legislative process is a series of hurdles. Uh, Getting it, uh, getting it uh, out of committee, getting it through another committee if it's a money bill, getting it onto the board, any place along the line, a committee chairman can just sit on it, or the speaker, or the Senate president. It almost sounds like uh, at these various levels, there seems to be a tendency to want to stop it or slow it down as opposed to pass it. Well, I think that's our that's our system. I think uh, the. Our federal system, the Constitutional Convention, uh, saw uh, uh, they wanted safeguards against uh, a government by fiat, which you would get in a in a, 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 a royal system or a or an autocratic system, and I think that's been one of the wonders of uh, the American polity. You talk about the committee system, one man, one vote. I was talking about the, the, the setup of politics in New Jersey generally. Uh, the county bosses. Is around the same time, is that when the boss system began to disintegrate? Absolutely. Because once people began to run in districts, and then when some of the districts overlapped county lines, they were no longer dependent on the boss. Uh, although there were some bosses flourishing. I mean, I mean, you got a boss in South Jersey that uh, that, that has elected senators uh, as far north as Bergen County, uh, and uh, so there is. You're talking that. about Hap, Hap Farley. I'm talking about George Norcross right now. Uh, Hap Farley's uh, had to do it a different way uh, through the Senate caucus. No, but but uh, it's different. But you can have a senator if you can raise the money if he's powerful enough that becomes a boss himself and because he can block any appointment in, in the county he lives in. Now, if his district is in two counties, I don't know if uh, he can block, uh, say, if he lives in Bergen and he lives in Essex and he represents part of Passaic. I don't know if he can block a Passaic County appointment. Or you say you didn't think that much of television when you started in the business, but as you went along, uh, did you were you able to utilize television to good effect? To I would say that, uh, that between John Spinelli and Governor Hughes and I, we were the first ones to really use television without it dropping in our lap. We uh, took the governor 
every week, one trip to New York and one trip to Philadelphia because those SOBs wouldn't come to see us. And uh, we had to go and get them a bunch of interviews on these poorly watched uh, uh, Sunday morning uh, shows. Uh, what they had to do to, to maintain their license there. I got to be very good friends with with John, the late John Scott. That way, later when he retired, I, uh, he used to interview you on Channel Nine WOR. But uh, we tried. We tried to milk it. Every which way. Did the governor's second wife, Betty Hughes, had her own television show in Philadelphia. Yeah, she was quite a personality. Did yeah. that help the Hughes administration much in any more, way? Much more than uh, his running around for these Sunday morning uh, talkies. <laughs> yeah, she was a figure in her own right. And she enjoyed it. She'd go down to the, uh, the Marriott, I guess it was, the fancy motel. And, with the canals and swimming pools down there by the television stations on City Line Avenue and do about three weeks worth of broadcast in two days there. And they were folksy. She was sort of an Irish uh, Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I guess really the last political campaign that you were directly involved in uh, was the 69 gubernatorial campaign. Yeah. <laughs> and that, was, uh, that brings back an old name, right? Minor. Bob Minor. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Where you get, how you were brought in by the by the state committee? Who by Minor's people? Who yeah, I brought, you brought in? myself in. Uh, when I uh, when I went out in the business on my own, uh, Bob Burkhart was the state chairman, and we had worked together in both of Hughes' campaigns. I said, "Well, we're going to make you the the, the uh, public re public relations director of the state committee." You'll be our client. It'll be a client, and I think uh, they gave me a thousand dollars a month, which was not, which was my basic fee in those days. Uh, uh, it was pretty good since my f my salary had gotten all the way up to eighteen thousand dollars. So one client at twelve, pretty good. Well, you're stretching that, right? I mean, that was only for the final three weeks of your job. Yeah, right? you know that. Yeah. <laughs> it was sixteen five. You know, <laughs> he's paying his lawyers nineteen. And it bothered me. Uh, so uh, uh, then, but I, I didn't, there was a primary fight too, Minor. I forget who he beat, Helstosky or someone. And, and so John Spinelli, uh, uh, who I guess had left, yeah, he, he handled Minor in the uh, primary. I said, I work for the state committee, I can't. So afterwards, I, uh, I, I got into Minor's campaign. I think he brought me in. What did you think of uh, Bob Miner oh. putting on the gloves once again? I wish he had put him on. He was so, so. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Uh, he was half-hearted about it all. His mind was. He would take time out from the campaign to run to one of his many board meetings. He'd get fifty dollars for his board meeting or something to go to, and, and he thought it was a piece of cake. He's the great Bob Miner, but he was hated by Kenny and. I forget, Kerry, I think, was, I don't know if Kerry was still boss of Essex or was it Harry Weiner? Uh, but, but Kenny hated him and uh, others, and he was old hat. And he didn't, uh, he hadn't kept up with things, and he thought he was running on his reputation. But you make it sound as if his reputation was not all that not, great. It was all right, but it was of, of another era. It's like a Mar Michael Jordan came back today and started to play basketball. Uh, he wouldn't do too well. He didn't do too well. He tried his comeback with Washington. So he got whipped. We had some pretty good issues, too. Was He He didn't prepare for his debates. That must have frustrated you. Oh, yeah. Well, I, and I, I wanted to go in there and go to Journal Square and make a martyr of himself, take on Kenny directly. We had this big meeting, all, all Democratic Party and one big room, and he reduced me to tears. I was a grown man. I'm not going to do that for you. And, and that was the only th chance we might have had. The papers would pick him up as an underdog fighting the bosses. Did that cause you to swear off political campaigns? No, self-survival. Sur sur uh, I had been intimately involved with this guy 
who was uh, questioning a lot of things about Cahill, including his much vaunted FBI service. And uh, a minor had come up, somebody gave him the information. Cahill was in the FBI for about seven weeks, and 11 weeks or something like that. And I wrote a speech all about that, which he flubbed, or didn't get any uh, attention. Uh, so I figured that uh, they could chop my head off. And they didn't, thanks to uh, some Bill Combe and a couple of good guys around Cahill, uh, Paul Sherwin and uh, Joe McCrane. They said they, they didn't want to punish me. Right? Which is kind of interesting when you think of how, how Republicans and Democrats go at each other's throats these days. Bill Combe was doing primarily Republican business. You were on the Democratic side, correct? Uh, he was doing business with the with legislature. Both? Yeah, sure. And, uh, when... Uh, when uh, we passed the sales tax early on, uh, uh, Bill Combe had been hired. Uh, this was in the second term. I was already a lobbyist, and I turned down. Uh, uh, some people had come to me from the menswear industry. They wanted to get out from under the sales tax. And I said, I already have a client, the mobile homeowners or something. Uh, mobile home sale sellers that didn't want going under the sales tax. So I said, I don't think I can take two. It would be a conflict. Uh, good app. So he went, to, I said, why don't you go to Bill Combs? So they had, they had Bill. And then uh, when they passed the sales tax, I found out I couldn't get my people out from under it because well, maybe I did. But anyhow, they found they had too much money. So they decided to take clothing out from under it. And John Kervick and I think Bob Burkhardt came and said, tell your friend Comb that he got the clothing out from under it. So I called him up, and he was a hero, and that was a major client he had for years. It was things like that. There was no, there was no, uh, 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 there was no unethical use of influence there either. I mean, it was a natural thing for, they already had food out from under, and they didn't need the money, so they took, Clothes from out under the. Okay. So even even with a Republican administration, you felt your your business thrived. Yes, it it, it held its own and it started to thrive. Uh, never did better than when Kane was governor. Yeah. Did you? It didn't hurt when when Byrne was governor either. Was was did you work directly with Bill Cahill at all on anything? Yeah, Bill Cahill. You know, oddly enough, I got to sort of know him. He's a good guy. You know. That's the way you yeah. described him. I saw in another interview that yeah. you described him as a good guy. But I almost got a uh, but. He, he a was good a guy, user with a rougher edge. <laughs> he was an Irish politician, and a, but he was a, had more bite than Dick Hughes. Uh, but not, not directly. I think he was a little uneasy, but I was pretty pretty friendly with. Uh, they had to take certain things away from me. I, I uh, well, I I held on to the medical school, which uh, I, I was. That was a genuine. That wasn't a political, uh, a political bone they get through me. I, along with George Smith, uh, I think I helped save the medical school in New Jersey. That was in use a second term, but uh, that was uh, before they, uh, the split Kale from came, Rutgers. Kale came up with the idea of uh, university of medicine and dentistry and all that, and then there was no need for me to. He wasn't going to throw me any. Uh, any bones like that. Right? I'm trying to think in something I read, I read, and I think I remember you saying, uh, you described Bill Cahill as kind of a, a Democrat. Oh, he was really a Democrat. Yeah, I think in his heart he was a city Democrat. We didn't have issues in those days like abortion and other things. I, I wonder how Hughes uh, and Cahill, they're, good, they're both good Catholics, how they would have come down on it. I, I, I don't know. And, some of the other social issues, but uh, but uh, yeah, I think in his outlook, he, he was a working class guy. From he represented Camden County in Congress, uh, industrial area. And uh, how did he wind up? Do you know how he wound up on the Republican side? Uh, given what you're saying, his background was. And I, I don't know. I have to talk to somebody who knows him better. But there were there were a number of people like that. Well, Case was cut from a different uh, cloth, but he wound up, uh, he was a Democratic, more Democratic than a lot of Democrats I know. And uh, People would say the same thing about Jacob Javits in New York, I guess, were cut from yes. the same cloth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, 
one of those guys. What was the environment like in Trenton uh, when bad things began to happen to the Cahill administration? A number of charges of corruption, people. Well, you know, bad things had happened to the Hughes administration, too, at the end. Guys, top guys were convicted, like my two closest friends in the administration. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I didn't, you know, I must have closed my eyes and mind to it. I couldn't stand it. Uh, Hughes and Burkhart, uh, Hughes, uh, uh, Kervick and Burkhart were both convicted. John Kenny was convicted. Jim Keneally, I think posthumously, was found to have run off with some woman and $400,000 of, uh, <laughs> of public money. <laughs> what was your reaction to this, to this? People who you knew, who you worked with, who you liked, were you, you're a pretty bright guy. I mean, were you surprised at what was going down? Yeah, I was. I was sort of open-mouthed about it. First guy I knew was, uh, uh, that I knew in jail was uh, uh, Pete Moradis, who had been Speaker of the Assembly when I was a reporter, Republican from Bergen County, a top uh, New York lawyer, a maritime lawyer. He was done in by the 1956 or 60, 56 uh, Israel uh, war against uh, Egypt. I, can I talk about it? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I think it, was, it may have been the 67 war, but the Suez Canal was jammed. And there were a bu whole bunch of ships stranded in there. And one ship caught there it was found later to have had three first mortgages on it. And uh, uh, Peter Moradis, who was this maritime admiralty lawyer, was involved in one or more of the mortgages. So he got con he got indicted and convicted and jailed uh, for a federal crime on that. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I the guy, I think I well, so even within the Hughes administration, uh, that, that came later, and uh, I was out of the. I was then on the street working. And, but Cahill had his own problems. Oh yeah, the, the, the whole thing with Paul Sherwin and and Joe McCrane, I think, was acquitted. They were and and, left, and Nelson Gross, uh, having to do with fundraising, telling people they could write off their contributions as uh, ta uh, as uh, tax free and uh, and and, uh, and uh, enabling them to do that. And, and then Paul uh, Sherwin on something to do with a highway. Pavement, paving contract or something. And then come, Brendan Byrne comes along, and I think if I'm quoting him or, or quoting, maybe even quoting you, government under glass. That was his term. No, but uh, by that time, um, we thought, he was, he was thinking about running, but Brendan was, Brendan was uh, the opposite pole of, say, our late governor, uh, Jim McGreevy. He, he wasn't chasing the, uh, in a lot of ways, but he, <laughs> He, he wasn't chasing uh, uh, the governorship. <laughs> he sort of let it come to him. In, in fact, uh, I'd always heard talk about Brandon as a future governor. I used to ask myself, why? Why is this guy so uh, uh, highly regarded? Way back when he was a young man working for Minor, I sort of knew him. Uh, people talked about Brandon Byrne. But anyhow, uh, there was going to be a, a Cahill looked very vulnerable in 19... Uh, 73. And uh, I think one of the uh, candidates was Congressman Henry Halstoski. And I had a, a friend, he had been a client. We had passed the, he was a trial lawyer. His name was uh, Michael, I guess he's still, uh, Jerry Breslin was his nickname. Real name was Michael. He's a uh, part of the famous Breslin family in South Bergen County. And he was a big trial lawyer and an activist. And he had uh, come to me with some colleagues back uh, a few years before that, and we uh, we passed a uh, a no fault auto insurance law, which the lawyers liked, and which held for quite a while. And so we got to be pretty close. It was a long, hard, interesting struggle. And he was hot for Brendan, and he also knew Henry Halstoski, and. Uh, and uh, we had it figured if Henry Helstoski dropped out of the race, um, we could, uh, Brendan should get in. And if Brendan was ready to go, but he wasn't ready to get into a big fight. And so Helstoski drew it out to right before the deadline, I think. 
And Breslin called me up and said, he's get, uh, I'll start, Henry's getting out. And I said, and Brendan's going in, I think. So I called Brendan, I sat down, I, I wrote a statement about it. how can you expect an administration that can't even take care of its own problems here and with the law to enforce the law and to do this and that. And I called Brendan up and I said, hey, Brendan, I, I think you should come down here, you should re come down here to the state house and resign not your resignation and your candidacy at the same time, because that's where you're going to get the publicity for it. Resignation from? Uh, the judiciary. Sure. He said, nah, I'll do it up here. I don't want to do it. I said, I got this statement for you. Ah, I just talk about it. I said, well, I'm going to fax it to you. I guess we had fax machines then or something. I'm going to get it to you. So I guess he liked it, because he came down and announced his uh, candidacy on the steps of the state house. Read the statement, pretty much, and take it from there. It was a, it was a nice, easy race. And then Kale, Kale got a, got upset in the primary by Charlie Sandman, and uh, that was the making of the, of the, that was that made the, the race even less difficult. I was going to say it was an easy campaign. Yeah. Were you pleased, were you concerned at all about, uh, you talk about uh, Brendan Burns' reticence, it sounds like, at least initially. What kind of campaigner was he, that he turned out to be? Well, I didn't go around with him that much. But you saw, you saw yeah, him. Well, I, you know, it, I saw him. He was all right. Uh, it was, Brendan was t always took it easy a little bit, a little lazy. Uh, he wasn't a use <laughs> in that way, but he didn't have to be. He had his, he had his way. He had his methods. Look at the, look at the second campaign, which wasn't easy. That was, he had a lot of guile. He was, he was a smart guy. He kind of took it easy. You might said he took it easy, but certainly when you look at the record, over the t the two terms, he got an awful lot done, sure especially did. the income tax. Oh uh, yeah. Well, he had a lot of help from the court. I mean, that was some hammer they dropped on these guys. I can remember, I was then living by myself. I had a domestic split, and I, I, I remember getting up in the, like 4 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night, Sunday morning, turning on the public New Jersey television, and, and these guys are debating the income tax there. Uh, uh, that, was, that was the court hammered that in. I think some of Brendan's other fights uh, we had to do them by himself uh, were more difficult. Such as? I think the Pinelands. I think... Uh, now Jersey. you were involved with the Pinelands, oh, yeah. but I on the other side. Yes. I think uh, New Jersey Transit, I was involved on the other side of that too. Uh, and they were, he had to, he had a, he had both houses of the legislature which can help you enact legislation, can also get you in trouble, as we found out with Hughes. Uh, uh, we, uh, yeah, he had to, those were his ideas, and he had to hammer them through. Who were his, who was his chief strategist, uh, in, first with the Pinelands and then in New Jersey Transit, basically the, the person, the persons you had to go up against? Well, on, uh, as a technician out on the floor, Harold Hodes, on, on the transit in particular, uh, I think, uh, I would say Brendan and I think John Degnan was uh, the was the, the, the AG at that time. I, I, I think he was uh, one of a, a big strategist with uh, the governor on that. I think Harold was the hammer for him. I don't know how much. Uh, I, I don't know the. Did you did you find the Byrne team was a formidable team in that regard? Were they were they you know, good tough competitors? Yeah, yeah. Well, we almost beat them on the transit thing. We had a we. Uh, Got the bill defeated in the assembly committee, and we went out and celebrated with lunch. And we came back, and we found there had been a second bill uh, put in. I didn't know that Harold knew it, and uh, that didn't go to that committee. <laughs> I was representing the private bus owners at the time. That was big threat. They were competing with the old uh, uh, New Jersey uh, public, public service, service. Yeah, coordinated transit. So, uh, yeah. uh, they, they've done all right. Okay. How about casino gambling? That was another. Oh, yeah. That was, uh, 
Well, that was a. Uh, there wasn't that much of a battle uh, like like these other issues I've talked about. Well, you but had to reject. You had to reject it initially, correct? Oh yeah, it was rejected. But I don't think Byrne took uh, that much of a role, and it was going to be state operated. I think it was in seventy five. It was rejected, or I don't know. Was it enacted in seventy five, and was it rejected under Cahill? I don't know. Can't remember. Don't know. I can't either. But anyhow, th this allowed for private operation, which is the system we have now. And it passed pretty well. I, they, I wasn't part of that campaign. In fact, I turned down a hell of a client because I was representing the privately owned racetracks. And I thought there was a conflict. And then uh, after I told uh, Bob Levy on the Atlantic City Rest, he says, well, you know what I did for you guys? I turned down this uh, resorts people that were coming in. And uh, I said, what'd you do that for? <laughs> you could have retired in 83 instead of 93. Uh, I could, uh, <laughs> so I was going to jump out the window, but I remembered I was only on the first floor. <laughs> you mentioned the second uh, burn campaign was a lot tougher than the first. And yeah. for people who remember back then, it was OTB. OTB, yeah. One term burn. Yes, and he looked dead. Yeah, everybody, in his, everybody around him was running against him in the primary. It was all in cabinet. Yeah. Why was he so exposed? Because of the income tax? Yeah, and in general, he got in bad press. I don't know, I think he... I, you had I, said he was not well, he was not well liked. He didn't do much to uh, en enhance his uh, image in the first term there. Uh, it was lackadaisical. And Aloof? Is that fair? I guess he came across that way, I don't remember. And there must have been other controversies. I don't know why he wasn't that well liked. Uh, well, the Republicans had a pretty tough, uh, pretty tough primary before they settled on Ray Bateman. They had Kane and Bateman, and uh, well, they're both nice guys. And Bateman looked like the better talk about a likable guy, Ray Bateman. But Byrne just uh, outmastered him, uh, and Bateman was too honorable to uh, uh, to really stick to his anti-tax position. He needed a Carl Rove. He, you know, he uh, he almost admitted that he, his tax program was weak or non-existent, and Byrne labeled it B.S. Bateman Simon. Bateman Simon plan, the yeah. B.S. plan. Yeah, that was clever. And it was I remember. And, uh, and in the debates, Bateman didn't stand up for himself. Byrne tore him apart. I was really surprised by the extent of it. Do. Can people like Ray Bateman, uh, can, can nice guys survive? And jumping ahead a little bit, perhaps off, off tangent, uh, going on a tangent, can people like that survive in the political world today in your mind? You know, it's very difficult. They start with about two and a half strikes against them. You have to have a, a certain uh, ruthlessness about you. And Ray Bateman never had that. I don't know that Brendan did either. But I, 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 I had enough. Yeah. He had guts, though, and going for some. When you look back at the uh, two-term burn, at his, at his legacy, what would you, how would you describe it? Well, I think the second term, uh, he did a lot of things. Uh, I think it was a great success. And I think he's enjoyed the fruits of it in, uh, in public regard ever since. And has got to be has gotten to be well liked and uh, oh yeah his, well, sense, of, his great, sense of humor yeah. is oh, uh, oh yeah well <laughs> almost to a professional level <laughs> well, I do know most of his <coughs> jokes <laughs> now you were told let's leave the the burn administration hmm? you want to take a break yeah I go to the bathroom okay good Don't how are we doing okay that. <laughs> it's a terrific joke okay hold on, hold on. Uh, we'll start off, uh, well, basically the transition will be, uh, we talked about the loss of influence of the county bosses, and yet there were four bosses who, you know, there was, when you were working, certainly, who blah, 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 who made their presence felt. Yeah, this is still bosses. So, so long. Yeah, well, that's true. Sir, the boss influence in Burns' decision to run or not run. Oh, okay. Okay. Are we on the same tape? So I don't know. Was there? I don't know. Well, I think he said he would... He said, I think, that Something. he would run if he got the Hudson law. Let's go back and uh, let's, <laughs> let's talk about uh, the 1973 campaign and the fact that uh, 
Brendan, Brendan Byrne uh, you know, was, uh, had to go through a primary. Who, were, you know, who was he going up against and what were the challenges that you saw that he faced? Well, I, I, uh, uh, we talked about Henry Halstoski. I think he needed a, a Hudson County was very important in the calculations then, much more than it is today. It was the largest Democratic vo vote producer. Essex was getting to be pretty big. But he didn't have Essex because uh, uh, Harry Lerner, or I guess, was the boss then, or chairman. Or I guess Kerry had gone by the wayside. Um, so uh, he had Ralph DeRose, who had been a state senator, as a favorite son candidate. And uh, uh, Hal Stosky uh, would have gotten the Hudson County line from whoever was the leader because uh, Kenny had gotten into trouble. He was convicted. And uh, so when Henry Halstasi, as, as I recalled earlier, decided not to go, that left Hudson uh, for Brendan to pick up. And he had friends there talking to whoever the leader was at the time. So that enabled, uh, that enabled Brendan to go in with a major uh, base in the primary. And uh, I think Ann Klein, who had been head of the League of Women Voters, and it was known as Madam Income Tax, uh, was running, which was no threat. And she was a Democrat Rose. for Morris County, right? She yeah, was she kind was, of an unusual yeah. uh, affiliation. Well, later in the uh, Byrne administration, they elected some Democrats. Oh, no, the earlier day, Steve Wiley had been elected. Gordon McInnes. Um, but no, uh, she was in there for the uh, true believers. And later, Brendan made her commissioner of institutions and agencies. Did uh, Helstowski was the only serious challenger in '73? No. So. In '77, Dr. Rosa um, turned out to be pretty formidable. He got a but good bite of the vote, but not enough. Yeah. In '77, though, there were far, far yeah, many everybody, more everybody, challengers everybody. because uh, I was the, uh, we talked a little bit about it before because of of the the burn record, especially the income tax. Yeah. Oh, right. he lost his own commissioner of. Uh, Labor and Industry, uh, Joe Hoffman, or Commissioner of Labor, I guess at the time. Oh, and the breakdown. Who was a good friend of mine because we had gone through the minor campaign together. Joe was uh, executive director or something, or camp executive director to state committee, 69 here. He was Brendan's commissioner, and he ran for governor against him. And, uh, there, were, do you remember a, maybe a lot of other people? A lot of other people in '77, uh, and I think you had said before uh, that there were so many of them that they basically split the vote. Yeah, I think Brendan won with 30 some percent. Oh yeah, and Dr. Uh, Paul Jordan was going to run. He was mayor of Jersey City, reform mayor and a medical doctor, and <laughs> unfortunately he lost the mayoralty uh, the previous uh, May. And so he couldn't run. Had there been any discussion among the anti-burn forces, as disparate as they were, about possibly unifying behind one candidate to unseat Governor Byrne? Uh, there may have been talk, but it didn't happen, obviously. Everybody was out for himself, and I Bob guess. Rowe ran. He had been as a congressman. Uh, formidable. Yeah. No, I guess they all had to, it, things looked so ripe that nobody wanted to give way to anybody else. And then I guess they sort of... Uh, after the primary, he said, forget about it. He's going to lose to Bateman, or who had won his own primary. And uh, that was a very unlikely come-from-behind uh, win. It was only the last couple of weeks, wasn't it, that they that he'd be in the, kind of the middle of October? Uh, I think the beginning of I, th I, I wasn't that close to the campaign. But I, 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 it was, I think it, it sort of took shape in the debates they had, which would be toward the end. And it was on the uh, burn... Uh, uh, pulling the the rug out from under uh, Bateman's fiscal positions, tax positions. Uh, you had mentioned some people, we're, as we talked about the '73 campaign, uh, in terms of people that uh, that Byrne, as well as other candidates, had to deal with at the county level. And this goes back to the the county bosses. Even though the boss system took a hit. Uh, with legislative districts redrawn and one man one vote, there were still people who were in power while you were working uh, while you were working down there, and as you just mentioned off camera, uh, uh, kind of still in power today. But let's talk about some of the people. Start with David Willens from Middlesex County. Well, 
and Dave was was getting on pretty well, but he was still the leader and highly respected, and still is uh, leader of uh, Middlesex County, and and he operated uh, one of the most successful and powerful law firms, which it still is, in the state, and uh, uh, he was one of the key bosses or leaders that nominated Hughes. And the, and the fact, the Democratic Party back in 61 when Hughes was nominated was a, a federation of bosses. Carey in Essex, Kenny in Hudson, Wilentz in Middlesex, uh, Brunner in Camden, um, a Keneally, Jim Keneally, sort of a boss in Union, but Union wasn't that strong that much of a democratic stronghold. And uh, Thorne Lord, of course, in Mercer, which was a stronghold. In fact, it's the most democratic county in the state, percentage-wise. And he was used as associate. So Hughes had to deal with them, and he dealt with them very well. They knew him and liked him, trusted him. Uh, Thorne Lord was his ambassador in there in the pre, uh, pre-nomination meetings. Because one of the main contenders was Grover Richmond, uh, who had been Attorney General under Minor. In fact, he served the whole second term of Minor as Acting Attorney General because the Republican Senator from his home county of Burlington would not confirm him for reappointment. And uh, he was never really challenged on it, and and he wouldn't say why. So everybody was suspicious that there was something dark in (laughs) Richmond's background. But he was, uh, he was originally the favorite to be the nominee. Another guy that could have been uh, the Democratic nominee in 61, he made a foolish mistake by not accepting it, was Frank Thompson, the congressman from Mercer County, protege of Lord and I guess of Hughes, because Hughes had been the leader of Mercer before he was a judge. But he was really in with the Kennedys. They called him Topper, and he was chairman of the House... Uh, he was mayor of Capitol Hill, the committee did, and I think... Uh, Ways and Means? No, it wasn't Ways and Means. Maybe he was Labor Committee, but he was up there. He was very influential and wanted to stay close to Kennedy's. He later got in trouble and went to jail. But he could have been a nominee, probably would have been elected. Much better known than Hughes and big liberal. But? But he decided to stay in Washington. So then the Lord had slipped Hughes, and that's when I got him. That's when they came to me, after Hughes was selected. I was covering... Mitchell, and I was covering those deliberations. Or John Davies was the, uh, the political writer in the news. I was covering the Mitchell Jones thing. Boy. And Davies was covering the Democratic deliberations. And lo and behold, I wound up uh, <laughs> with the product of those deliberations. When we talk about bosses, uh, I think most people, political bosses, uh, people may come up with kind of the same vision as someone who who likes to strong arm people who twist twi- or twist arms to get things done is that fair to generally to apply to the people that you talked about Dave Wentz uh, uh, Den- uh, Dennis Carey in Essex John Kenny and Hudson where they all kind of cut off out of the same cloth well they're all different types but go, but go, the, into, but go but into that the basic the, the, no, the, the common denominator is sure they they twisted arms one way or another. But did they do they, one do they it gave a you, smile? You, or? They gave you your nomination. For whether it was for county clerk or assembly or senate, they put you on the ticket. If that isn't twisting arms, I don't know what is. They got you elected. They made you what you were. But did their, did their styles differ? The end result oh, might have been the same. Uh, they, differed, uh, they differed in many ways. I mean, Thorne Lord was as different... Uh, as different from the other bosses as anybody you can imagine. I mean, th- he was uh, he was a, an admixture of, a, of of he looked like Raymond Massey playing Abraham Lincoln in the movies. He dressed in shabby Brooks Brothers suits, like one of the Kane family, with uh, loafer shoes. He. Uh, was bo- had been born in Plainfield, New Jersey, but spoke with a southern accent because he grew up and went to Suwanee or somewhere down south. He was an idealistic liberal Democrat of the Adley Stevenson type. 
while uh, Kenny and Kerry, you both, they look like they came out of the same Irish urban politician type, like Mayor Curley or Mayor Daly or somebody like that. And they, you know, Kenny replaced Haig. He was a different sort. Well, he was a solemn, quiet, secretive guy. Kenny, uh, Kerry was a, a loud guy. A loud kind of, uh, it wasn't crude, but he, he, he wasn't smooth either. And, uh, well, how about Dave Lentz? You told Dave Lentz was a uh, Dave Lentz was a sharp. Uh, he looked a lot like his friend George Jessel. I mean, he was a, <laughs> a sharp Jewish guy with his uh, urban uh, urban overtones and undertones, and uh, uh, he had been a turn. He was a sharp lawyer. Of all the bosses in the state, I think he was the only lawyer among the bosses. Well, the Democratic boss in the state. Oh, Lord, 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 and Lance were the lawyers. Was was he the strongest? In other words, if did the bosses look to any per, one particular boss? Uh, no, when Hague had been mayor, everybody got their financing from Hague. But uh, no, it was a federation, as I said, and they uh, they were all. They were all uh, more or less independent satrapies. But there wasn't kind of a first among... Uh, Kenny and Kerry were first, or Kenny was, I suppose, because the legacy of Hague, Hudson County, and the votes they turned out. But he had his enemies all the time. They had contested city elections. And once the Hague uh, uh, monopoly was broken, uh, Hudson County was highly contested, especially in the nonpartisan uh, municipal elections, which told the whole story there. Uh, no, and uh, uh, it, it had changed a lot from, from 1949 on. Uh, and how much of an impact did the convention have on that? Pardon? How much of an impact did the Constitutional Convention have on that? Oh, in immense. In 46. Immense, not immediately, but it, uh, oh, 46 or 50, 50 uh, 67. No, the first, no, 46, the first one. Not much. Uh, uh, not much at all because you still had uh, 21 senators, and you had uh, they ran at large in the assembly. So uh, Kerry nominated uh, uh, didn't elect always, but they nominated 12 people on the same mm. ticket in Essex, mm. nine people on the same ticket in Hudson, six on the same ticket. They all ran at large. I think I may be getting my dates. I think the Constitutional Convention was in 47, 46. and then it's 47. 47, and then the other one was 66. 66, exactly. yeah, right. But that, and that's when, th that's when things began to change relative to the Because of the one man, one vote. One man, one vote. the Supreme Court, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the year we want to go back a little bit and talk about Governor Byrne, if we can, before he was Governor Byrne. You said he was on minor staff. If you could, could remember, go back a little bit more and talk about uh, the governor as a young man. Well, I remember as this young lawyer, everybody said, he's a real comer. And, and, and I, I, came, I came to Trenton uh, uh, with Miner's uh, inauguration, essentially, you know, a couple of weeks before. And I had really hadn't covered the campaign that much. I was a fill-in, as I told you. Uh, I came in, and Byrne was one of the young men in, inside. I think he was acting executive secretary in the very beginning, before Burkhart got the job as the executive secretary, which is an important role. It's a, it's a constitutional role, I think, or a legal role. Uh, and uh, he was in there. I got to know him sort of uh, as a reporter, a young reporter. He was a young guy in there. Then he got sent up to Passaic County. I think the governor took over the prosecutor's office. Those were the days of uh, corruption investigations in the various counties. And Passaic County was a Republican-dominated county. I used to have a Republican prosecutor, and I think Miner took over the office. And I think he sent John Thevos up there, uh, and Byrne was on his staff. So, uh, so Brendan Byrne. Because I knew about him. I'd see him when he'd come to Trenton and this high, and uh, and, and I, I said, boy, everybody talks about Byrne. I'd say, boy, he, what, he's going to be governor someday. I never knew why. He seemed to be a quiet guy, and he sort of mumbled like he does now. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good-looking sort of guy, very fit, pudgy. No, he's so lean these days. And has I, can you look back now, or did you ever and, and look and find something maybe that you missed back then and say, "Oh, that's why people were talking about him." No, he was always a reluctant dragon. You know, I told you about when he wanted to be uh, uh, when he wanted to be uh, uh, when I wanted him 
to declare to come down governor. And to come down and come down to Trenton. Yeah, but there was another occasion when Hughes was elected governor. He was looking for uh, for an alcoholic beverage control director. Now that had been a very big job in the 40s. Alfred Driscoll was ABC director. I think he was the second one after repeal. And I was very sensitive to that. My parents had a liquor retail liquor license in Kearney, and the ABC director was a big man. And uh, and Driscoll, in fact, uh, made his reputation. He got elected governor based on that. And uh, uh, so Bur uh, you said to me, you know, he didn't want that job. He was prosecutor. I had written some stories about that too. I'll tell you about that. Uh, uh, he was prosecutor. I said, I can't believe that he, he wouldn't take this job. It's a real stepping stone. So I, w I said, let me go up. I lived in South Orange at the time, and Byrne lived in West Orange. I said, Governor, let me drive over and talk to Brendan. Tell him what a mistake he's making. So I drove over to his house on this hilly street. And he's out there in the street shooting baskets with the kids. He's playing, playing boys. Always was a athletic. And I hey, good. Hey, Brendan, so... You're crazy not to take this. He said, no, I want to stay where I am, uh, a prosecutor. And uh, I said, Gee. so I went back to the governor and said, you're right, he didn't want it. I said, boy, I'd be, uh, if I were you, I'd be mad at him for turning you down here. So he was so mad at him, he made him a judge later. <laughs> <laughs> that was you. He didn't get insulted. Uh, Joe, let me uh, just jump ahead and let's uh, let's talk about your, we were talking about Governor. Are we kind of finished with that? With your early impressions of Governor Byrne, you think we hit that okay? Yeah. Uh, Anything you else? You want to talk about uh, his appointment as prosecutor? I think that's pretty interesting. Okay, go ahead. Well, uh, I was think, I was covering Essex County as well as state politics. It was in 1959. I looked it up before I came here, uh, and uh, there was an opening coming up. Uh, there was a Republican prosecutor. In, Charlie Webb and his term was expiring and there was a lot of fussing the newspaper the Newark News was very interested in it and uh, Donald Fox who had been elected state senator the first Democrat to have that job from Essex since World War One uh, he, he was he had sort of broken with Dennis Carey who was the Democratic boss of Essex and uh, the Newark News helped him get elected in an upset in 1955 he wanted the prosecutorship, but the Democrats uh, prevailed on him to stay in, and he had a good chance of getting reelected. And they wanted to hold on to the Senate seat. And this was when uh, there were only 21 Senate seats, and uh, it had been Republican, and they thought they could hold that for the Democrats. And so uh, uh, Byrne wanted, uh, uh, not Byrne, uh, Governor Minor wanted Brendan Byrne, who had been on his staff, to be prosecutor. And Dennis Carey didn't like Byrne, didn't trust him. I guess he was too much oriented with the governor, whom Carey had his difficulties with. Uh, not fatal, but they didn't. And uh, uh, I, I called him up and talked to him. He says, said, you're going to let, you, you're going to let, uh, and Donald Fox had the power to block him, not Carey, because of Senate, uh, courtesy. The Donald Fox was? was the Democratic senator who wanted a job himself. And the Newark News wanted Byrne because they didn't like Kerry. Kerry's the old type Irish boss. This, this was the waspy Republican paper. Uh, didn't like Irish bosses in the Democratic Party. They liked Republican bosses who were, called themselves leaders. Uh, and uh, so uh, there was this three-way pull, four-way pull. And I said to Kerry, uh, how about Byrne for prosecutor? And he said, he's going to be prosecutor over my dead body. I said, can I print that, Denny? He said, sure. So I printed it. I haven't been able to locate the story, but I, <laughs> but I remember writing it. And, and, uh, but so, soon enough, uh, uh, with the pressure from the Newark News, Fox said, I'll, if the governor appoints him, I'll confirm him. So, oh, uh, the minor had sent him in as acting prosecutor, uh, which you could do. So he's running the office. So that broke down. He became prosecutor. And, of course, uh, uh, later, uh, 
then we went back to when Hughes became governor, wanted to, to move him uh, out of there, make him ABC director, finally made him a Superior Court judge, and that's when he went to the governorship. That, that's what I wanted to add. But, uh, um, let's talk about going back again, uh, get some more detail about the lobbying that you did in the Byrne administration against uh, two major the pine projects. lands, uh, the metal, yeah, the metal, the metal lands. No, not the metal lands. Oh, no, excuse me, no, pine, I'm, I'm the pine land, uh, 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 pine lands, and ca and casino gambling. N no, and no, 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 the uh, New Jersey transit. Transit, I'm sorry. Okay. Pine lands and New Jersey transit. Well, New I was representing the bus industry. We'll start with the New Jersey transit first, the privately owned buses, and they'd always been in the battle with public service coordinated transport, which which was the uh, uh, the transportation arm of the gas and electric company, the big monopoly. And uh, things started to go bad for them in the 60s. They started losing money on transit. And the state subsidized them. And later, to some degree, they sub subsidized my clients, too. Because otherwise, they were going to fold. The, the automobile was supplanting buses, and the state was going suburban. I was going to say the development of cars. malls, the development of malls outside malls, yeah, of all that. center areas. It's, it's, uh, so you, you couldn't have unsubsidized transit. So then uh, uh, Byrne came up with the idea that uh, they're going to take over. I mean, he came up with it. Or the guys at Public Service came up with it and convinced him to take over. The, the, they were the, mo the, the megalith there. They, they were about 60 to 70 percent of all the public transit in the stations in the state. My guys were the rest, the smaller lines. And uh, so uh, we, we were, they were scared to death, my clients, uh, of the state operating against them. So we fought it, the tooth and nail. And in fact, we beat it. Uh, remember, the chairman of the Assembly Transportation Committee was a guy from Kearney, John Italian American, I can't remember his name. He died. He died. So. Uh, and we blocked the bill in committee, and uh, and we uh, this was in the morning, and we defeated it. And there was the legislature was coming to an end. Went out and had a nice lunch at Lorenzo's. We came back that afternoon, and they had introduced the same bill in the assembly, and it had been assigned, hadn't been assigned to committee, and Harold Hodes, who was uh, Burns' uh, legs and <laughs> man in the legislature. <laughs> he had the speaker bring the bill up, uh, bring the bill up without going to committee. So they passed it. <laughs> Didn't they have to go to certain, get a certain majority? Was, was it a majority or a super majority oh, we to couldn't, do that? No, we just needed a majority. We couldn't, we couldn't carry it. We had, if we were going to beat it, we were going to beat it in committee. Well, we got about four or five votes out of seven. And we got, we did. But uh, they didn't play fair. <laughs> <laughs> how long? Move. How long before well, they survived? Fine. And then the, the state and the Port Authority buys them buses too now. But they're far fewer in number, right? I can remember the Manhattan, well, well, Manhattan Transit, which uh, you well, know, they all sold out to, to Coach is a big owner. Coach they're, USA and Coach USA and uh, kind of only there's some smaller ones, but they're only. A lot, of the, a lot of the small ones all sold out to coach, uh, all the ones you remember. Uh, oh, yeah, there were hundreds of bus lines. I used to, when I was a kid growing up in Kearney, I, I went to, used to go to, to New York via Garden State Transit. Started out in Paseca somewhere and wound up in Journal Square. <laughs> and I'd take the twos, but uh, things change. Yeah. I remember in Patterson, uh, we used to take what was called the, the name of a future uh, singing group, the Subsquehanna Transfer. Uh, and oh, you used yeah, to take yeah. it to the Helix uh, in, in, I guess it was West New York and Bergen County, and you would get on a public, that was the transfer, of the public service tra bus would take you into the a Port Authority building. That's and how they didn't have a Port Authority York. building. Then, you know? that, but they when, did, when they did it, that, oh, you're that like was when they started. I, yeah. That was when they started. I remember going to the Borscht Belt on the Susquehanna Railroad once. <laughs> in the 40s. <laughs> Let's go back to the, the, to the Pinelands, uh, which again is a, ma uh, a major accomplishment. Uh, oh, Although yeah. you might not think so, uh, or well, didn't think no, so then. Yeah, it was a major accomplishment. Well, Byrne came up with this idea from where, I think he got it from John McPhee, the writer, uh, about this great natural resource. I never heard of the Pinelands, uh, a bunch of scrub trees. 
And uh, I was then flourishing as a lobbyist, and, and all these builders, I never heard, all came to me, a whole coalition of them. And, uh, and uh, they wanted me to stop it. Well, sure, I'll try. And we, we cooked up some name uh, of a group, I sound pretty. And we just, and it was phenomenal, the, the, the dimensions of this part of the state that he wanted to, uh, to uh, take over and ban development in. I said, this, uh, I can't get over this. I, I then cooked up what I thought was my smartest PR, I, the smartest PR idea of my whole career. I, I said, let's, I got some artist or map maker to outline the dimensions of that uh, Pinelands tract. I said, let's do an overlay of that onto North Jersey. And it went from the top of Berg, Bergen County up almost to High Point up in the Passaic County, all the way down to Flemington or somewhere, and took everything in. I said, this is, what, this is what the governor wants to stop development in. Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, any echoes of that uh, with the recent Highlands uh, legislation? Yeah, the yeah, some. Well, yeah, without some of the funny business about quick approval and all that. Uh, oh, they later modified a lot. Of, but he did save it. It was quite an accomplishment. Did you? I don't think it'd be better off if we had a, uh, a, a, a Walmart and Home Depot and that down in uh, where the canoes run. <laughs> did you take on issues or take on clients with whom you might have disagreed? Or did you always, the, the business that you did was always uh, uh, on issues that you were supportive of? No. I always took on, I took on any, I uh, borrowed from the attorneys, the lawyers. Everybody deserves a lawyer. So everybody's an entitled advocate. to representation. Yeah, somebody once asked me, uh, some students, uh, anybody you wouldn't take on? I thought, all right, I said, well, <laughs> Hitler? <laughs> Tough <laughs> There are clients I wouldn't take on. But I, I, I took, I, I had tobacco for many years and paid a lot of tuitions. Uh, uh, but I would never argue that cigarettes were good for you, as some people tried to do. I mean, I found other reasons. Uh, it was legal. And, uh, a lot of businesses, small businesses, depended on the sales, particularly where they bordered other states. And I took them on as an advocate of not increasing their taxes first. In fact, I was recommended by Robert Miner. Bill Cohn and I were recommended, and we represented the Tobacco Tax Institute. Later, I represented the industry. One of the things going back now to the Hughes administration is we talked about your your value. I want to add to that oh, too. Oh, go right ahead. Um, and the clients recognized that, because I, rec I I represented um, the medical society at the same time I represented tobacco. I was there tobacco many years before. And when the doctors came to me, I said, look, you might regard there might be a conflict here. Uh, I have tobacco, and it's, you people say it's not healthy, but I, I'm not going to confuse the issues. I'm not going to preach that it's healthy. Yet I'm not going to advocate. They, they weren't interested in advocating for laws against tobacco. That was just incidental later on. And, uh, but uh, if you want me to work for your interests, which were largely... Uh, Turf wars, uh, everybody wanted to practice medicine. Well, this was part of the physician's assistant. Uh, well, I was one of many. Social workers, uh, physical therapists, everybody wanted to. Optima optometrists and things like that. So that was agreeable to them, and we had a pretty good run. You, were a sp you wrote the budget messages for all, all the budget messages that Dick Hughes uh, For wrote? Dick Hughes, yeah. yeah. Well, I did it when I was working for him. Right, first time. I knew the because I knew the budget process from my days as a reporter. In the early days, that Jake Martin told me that's how you're going to learn about state government. He had me sit through every budget hearing. I almost brought it up when we started talking because we talked about when you're, what you were covering. You were covering planning. You were covering this, and then I was going to say, and you also found out about budgets, and you never mentioned it back then. I'm glad you brought it up now. Yeah, I, uh, that's how I learned about state government because things came out at those budget hearings that you never knew about otherwise, you know, these little agencies and everything. That's why when I went to work for Hughes, I knew more about the inner workings of the state government than he did. And uh, that uh, Kervik, Kervik might, he's state treasury, 
But Burkhart and the other people, they didn't know about that. And I did from, the, from those days. And I used to write little stories about it. So I, I knew Abram Mullen and Walt Wexler. They were the two the top guys, a director and deputy director. And I worked well with them. And so uh, the governor would send me up uh, to work with them. And I'd do a big draft. And then we'd call him in and other people. Uh, they would get all the stuff from the departments and throw stuff together. And we'd sit down and, and work for days. And right? it was kind of fun. I liked those guys. And then we'd take you to the governor and you make his changes. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and even after I... Uh, left the governor's office and went into PR later to become lobbying. I, I had the governor's, the state committee as, as uh, my client and their interest was the governor's interest. So under that guise, I, I was deputized uh, to, uh, uh, to continue writing the governor's, the budget message because uh, Vermeulen and Wexler wanted me to do that. Oh, and in, the same, in that same role, I was his press secretary at the 1968 Democratic National Convention, which was an exciting time in my life. Uh, yeah. Well, that's an exciting time for a lot of people. Yeah, you were cool. out there during that... Uh, I was out there when he was chairman of the Credentials Committee. I was out there when I thought he was on his way to be the vice president under Humphrey. <laughs> ever threatened with jail during that time? What? In 68, were you ever threatened with jail? By whom? Uh, well, what was going on at the 68 convention? Oh, I was cloistered. I was in the, uh, <laughs> on the floor. I was up in the hotels. We, were, we didn't even know the riots were going on until John McLaughlin ran up to the governor on the floor. He goes, you know what's happening out there? Why are you doing something about it? Like, John, uh, uh, what, what's going on? We didn't, have, we didn't look at television. We were all on the floor of uh, the, the, the old arena out by the stockyards. Out there. Did you ever... When the Byrne administration came along, were you, uh, did you ever solicit or were you solicited to write budget messages or any other speeches no, for him? No, no, no. I, I had severed my relationship with the state committee when Cahill became governor and the state committee became broke in 1970. No <laughs> fees, no work. <laughs> well, the Democratic Party was on its uppers. <laughs> I want to ask you a, a general question and then some more specific questions about the office holders themselves. The general question is about the evolution of the governorship in the time that from 19, the early 1950s when you started working as a reporter. Uh, so we're talking basically about 50, 51 to 93. How have you seen the governor's office evolve? In terms of in terms of power, well, the governor, as the governor ever since '46, has been a, by law and by fact the most powerful, sought-after, and visible office in the state. What other states do you have senators quitting? U.S. senators quitting to become governor. It's usually the other way around. Even in big states. Which was kind of surprising when you yeah, said... You know, Harrison Williams wanted to be governor at one time. He was. But Frank Thompson did not. You had said Congressman Thompson did right. not want. Which well, he, was, kind of he was uh, fascinated by the Kennedys. He was in the inner circle, or the second inner circle. Very close. Have some used their power greater than, uh, more than others? Oh, absolutely. Uh, had the they? opportunity to use it. I think uh, Driscoll... Uh, built the turnpike. That was his big. And he was uh, responsible for the Constitutional Convention. I wasn't around and I was in college. Here. Uh, and uh, uh, Minor didn't really. He took care of things. Like you said, a caretaker. Yeah. yeah. Although at the time he looked. Uh, but there, was n there were no. There were the biggest issues that he tried to do something about were the, the water, the dams. So small. There were issues in about Spruce Run, Chimney Rock, and things like that. Yeah, really small potatoes now when you think about it. Hughes was very active. And, uh, we got the first state minimum wage. We got the first broad-based tax. We got the Department of Higher Education. Uh, I think uh, Hughes started a, I'm not sure, a public defender. Was that started under Hughes or under Byrne? I don't know. Uh, I think it was under, I think it was, 
Oh, Stanley Van Ness? No, the public defender. I'm sorry. That was the public advocate. Uh, public, uh, uh, public, public advocate. Public defender. I'm th a oh, public okay. advocate. I'm okay. thinking of. Public defender was started by under mandated the court. Public advocate. I don't, I don't know. But the whole th but a lot of other things. And of course, strike benefit, benef uh, unemployment benefits for strikers uh, under use. That uh, was cost us both houses of the legislature. Uh, uh, integration of schools. And we'll talk about that. Contributed to that defeat, but it, he was tried. It was an act. Uh, it was after I left his office, and I was still connected with him, through the state committee and through him. But uh, it was a very activist time. And uh, Kale didn't. Kale did the Meadowlands uh, thing. That was uh, that was his big. How much of that was Bill much. Kale, and how much of that was Sonny Werblin? Do you recall? It was Bill Cale, and he found Sonny Werblin. I don't know how he found him. Uh, they found McCrane. McCrane, uh, it was his idea. He he was uh, uh, heavily involved with the Garden State Racetrack. He was Eugene Morey, who owned it and built it. Was his, he was McCrane was his son-in-law. And they came up with this idea to. I don't know who else was involved in it, and uh, they came up with it. And Brendan Byrne gets a lot of credit for that. He doesn't deserve any of it. Because, in fact, we almost stopped it with Brendan Byrne. Because? I was hired by Robert Willens. I was hired by Robert Willens on behalf of Monmouth Park to try and stop the Meadowlands after Byrne was elected. When he, It was either in the interim period between the election and, and inauguration or early on in his administration to uh, try and stop the bond sale or try and stop going forward with because the of the competition from the race from the proposed with, with race Monmouth track. Park. That's how I, that's how I got to represent the private tracks, and Brendan almost stopped it. And, uh, I think Rockefeller got into Wall Street and he couldn't sell the bonds or something like that. It's another one I almost won. <laughs> <laughs> Did well by losing. I think. If he had been successful, <laughs> he would have never had his name on what is now the Continental Airlines. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should have changed his name to Continental Airlines. <laughs> uh, what about what about? The, I'm telling uh, you more about my defeats. It's hardly a <laughs> <laughs> probably possibly more memorable because there were so well, few. I had some successes too. Um, talk about uh, we talked pretty much about Governor Byrne about uh, certainly uh, his accomplishments. Uh, what about let's talk a little bit about about the, uh, the governor's office uh, in the 80s and early 90s and probably and stop with say Christy Whitman if we if we can. So let's talk about Tom Kane. Tom Kane. Uh, assumed the governorship uh, and the, when the economy was, or the economy became flush. Yeah, but it wasn't flush then. They were in a tax crisis and he had made the typical Republican promise. Uh, no new well, taxes. Uh, I don't think he said, uh, uh, read my lips. We already had state and inc no increase tax. He didn't have new taxes. But he was on, on, a, on the economy. Typical, he had to be. Typical Republican promise of. Uh, not increasing taxes, and he did a he did a very smart thing. He forced uh, Alan Karcher and whoever was the who was the speaker of the uh, or leader, maybe the majority leader of the assembly, whoever was running the Senate to to hand him a tax bill. I think there were few, if any, Republican votes on it, so he was able to figuratively hold his nose and sign it. We talk about liberal Republicans. I remember. Uh, Tom Kane, Tom Kane and Phil Kaltenbacher, I think, were two Essex County, young Essex County uh, assemblymen uh, back in the early 70s. And I thought both of them had reputations as the liberal Republicans that we talked about. Well, Essex County, whatever that means, yeah, sure. I mean, they weren't, they weren't Goldwater rights. They, they didn't. Uh, that was probably they the weren't red there. hunters, uh, red screamers, and they were two well-heeled uh, heirs. So sure. Yeah. Of Kane, go back to the revolution and go uh, back a generation or two and making upholstery for cars. You know, you know, it's funny, we're talking, not really to go off uh, topic, but we're talking about how the governorship has changed and the people we've talked about, uh, you, always, you were referring to their battles with the legislature. So let me bring that up now. Uh, the New Jersey governorship may be the strongest in the country, but they still have to deal 
with the two houses of the legislature. And you indicated before, even when you have control of the, house, of the Senate and the Assembly, that doesn't necessarily mean that your programs are simply going to be approved. Of course not. I mean, that's the American system. What, what governor doesn't have to deal with his legislature? But you have a lot of chips to bargain with. I mean, if a legislator wants a, if a senator wants to make a judge, who uh, nominates the judge? Well, has governor. the power shifted? I think what I'm trying to get at, There's has the power trading. shifted to the legislature? Some of the power shifted oh. to the legislature, do you think? Well, essentially, uh, it's, it's more... It's, it's in different form in the legislature now. You could deal with the one guy in the Senate, Hap Farley, when there was a Republican legislature and 21 senators, pretty much, on, on getting a bill moved. Because if a majority of that minority, which they would generally have like 14, 14 7 Republican, if you had uh, uh, eight Republican senators, and Farley controlled about six of them. No. South Jersey, the bill was going to go up or down. But Farley wanted the, the, the appointees, he wanted certain people to be judges, prosecutors, members of election boards, tax boards, and the governor could bargain. And he could still do it now. But, the, the, but within the legislature, the power is not as concentrated. You've got, as you indicated, the committee system. Now, yeah, that's another which hurdle. Which offered you a lot more work because yeah, there was one committee, one committee hurdle. It was in the Senate. It was it was the Republican caucus, and I think it was the caucus, the caucus system in the House too. It was more diffuse, and then the House would sometimes be Democratic or wider split because it was one man, one vote essentially. But the, uh, you were elected. You could have a county that was 51 percent. A Republican and 49 Democrat, and they'd elect 12 Republicans. Uh, but the, when you had the districts after the 66 convention, then it really became diffused. Drawing to the end of your career, we could go past the Kane administration. What did you think of Jim Florio? What do you think of Jim Florio? Well, I don't think he's a nice guy. Uh, I think he's a uh, I think he's a, I think he's a guy with uh, strong governmental principles. I, I, I think he has an autocratic streak that he doesn't know how to camouflage. Which uh, hurt him considerably. Hurt him, hurt him with me. I, I found I couldn't talk to the man. I found he had a decent guy in Joe Salima who later got in trouble you could talk to. But... uh. Uh, I mean, he, he, he felt he, he was, he was uh, when he was governor, I thought he was a know-it-all. And I mean, I had certain credentials with him. Uh, I knew him when he was a young assemblyman. We could talk and things like that. And, and I, when I would talk to a governor about something, I wouldn't say do something because it's for me. I would like a hearing for me to be able to uh, show how this is not fair to my client. And if you do it this way, it might be good for you. I could get that from Kane. I got that from Byrne. I even got it from Cahill's people. Of course, I got it from Hughes, and, and uh, there was a personal thing there too. But I, I felt, I, I felt, I, I it really, I, I, I did, I thrived. I did all right under Florio, but the, the good taste went out of my mouth with it. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, let's see, he uh, got elected in. Uh, I supported him in his campaigns too against Kane, and and uh, he got elected in '89 and lost. Yeah, yeah. He, so that's when I decided to get out of the business. Uh, in '90, I, I was really. Yeah, I sold the business. No, but no. I mean, you're making it sound as if you got out of the business because Jim Florio got elected. No, after he got elected. After, but I mean, after he got elected. Yeah, I said. But there was no, there was no linkage it. then. Yeah, it's, it became, became uh, troublesome to me. Uh, I have to go kiss this guy's behind. Strive to, strive to get a word in with him, you know. Just, just to get, just to, to say one thing to him. You, I have to make arrangements to go to some thousand dollar a plate fundraiser so I could get, catch him on the fly for, for uh, two minutes. Was he knew he had all the answers, Jim Florio. Were politics and politicians turning that way as well? In other words, 
Uh, was it becoming just more difficult to deal with individual politicians? Oh, I, people deal with politicians now. I, I, I was getting on. I was uh, in my middle 60s. And, uh, uh, Were you looking for a way out? Yeah, I was. I didn't know how. And uh, I was exploring with different people. And it took a while. And uh, But by the end of 90, I had worked at this deal through Bill Combe with uh, Harold Hodes and Roger Bodman, they'd buy me out, and I'd, I'd work a couple of years and uh, uh, transfer to client base, and then two more years I'd get an override on it. And so it worked out pretty well. And, uh, I was so I got out two weeks before my uh, my 66th birthday. Yeah. Social Security was in. I could live in Social Security. <laughs> Do you feel comfortable <laughs> enough uh, to talk about Christine Whitman? I don't know that much about her. Uh, I. Uh, um, I didn't lobby her because I was out of it. Um, but as someone who has been around politicians all his professional life, oh yeah, well, I think she was uh, uh, aloof, much more aloof from the legislature and everybody. And uh, <coughs> I think she was a decent person. I don't know how approachable she might have been if I were still lobbying. Did her. you know her dad at all? Very well. I knew her mother, too. Webb Todd was a good guy. He was a good friend of Dick Hughes. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I didn't know her at all. I mean, she sort of vaguely knew who I was. And uh, uh, I was on the Rector's Board of Trustees. Uh, I wanted to be on the Board of Governors, and I went to Florio. And then the Selena said, well, we want to put you on the trustees now. Uh, um, but later, we'll. I, I found out why. They had some guy named Art Kamen, you probably know. Journalism and, grad at Rutgers. Yeah, I know, and he was a burr in their side uh, of the board. And, and he, they couldn't confirm a successor to him because he had, he had been editor to Red Bank Registers. So he, had, he was in with the senators there, and they wouldn't confirm a successor. But Florian knew they would confirm me. I, I didn't know that. I wouldn't have taken a job I knew I was going to put Art out of it. And so they, they got me in there, and they got rid of him. But I never got up to that. But I used to, I counted Christy uh, several times. Where, where, as a member of the Board of Trustees here, you're like a potted palm. I dress you up in a, in a, in a uh, cap and gown, and you, your scenery for graduation. So nice red robes. I did, I did that. Well, I did that once. And, <laughs> okay. you know, you know. How has the lobbying business changed over all this time? Your daughter, my is daughter, a yeah, and she's only indirectly from me because uh, before I made my decision how to get out, she was between jobs. She'd worked in government, and she's got an MBA, and she worked on Wall Street. And uh, she'd come down to help me out, and she was the mainstay. Cause some of my associates were. Leaving, they took a couple of clients with them, but it was still a good business. And so we made the arrangement. They asked that she stay to help in the transition, which she did for six months, and I stayed for two years. And then when she left, then they found they needed her some more. They brought her back. So she worked for uh, Public Strategies and Impact, which later combined, about ten years. And she went out on her own about three years ago. So she's a lobbyist, and so I hear from her. Well, all of these things that were in the formation, the committee system and all that, have uh, become uh, institutionalized now. And she doesn't know any other way to deal except through that whole. And uh, the, the fundraising, the ni all the numbers are larger. Of course, when I was a lobbyist, you could get a good pastrami sandwich for a dollar and a half <laughs> instead of eight and a half uh, or whatever. So the, the fees are up high now. And the, and uh, God, we went to a $200 dinner. It was a lot now. They have these $1,000 dinner. They're having uh, assembly fundraisers now in December of 2005. And the election was last month. People are trying to catch up. Or are they looking at the next For next time, $1,000 leadership fundraiser. What about the element of time? Because you had mentioned earlier uh, computers, new technology, uh, new oh. media. Uh, you were never under that, or maybe in the, the probably no, weren't under that kind of pressure. 
The closest thing I came to was having a, a dedicated word processors where you could type out, where you could write one letter to the whole legislature and put their first names in where you knew them on that basis. And, uh, and it worked out on an electric typewriter thing. Do you think that makes the business of well, now, more, more yeah. difficult because of the things are changing so rapidly that maybe you lose control over what you're trying to do? No. I, I think it's a great. Uh, the computer is the greatest thing that ever happened to lobbying. My daughter can keep track of more things, more certainly than I ever could. I mean, I mean she had, uh, every bill that she's watching... It comes up on her screen in her office or in her home. She's got them linked together. And you would have to go, you would have to get a car. Oh, we'd have uh, Clark Martin was my associate for many years. And one of his big jobs was going through the list, the board lists, the committee lists, and comparing with what we were watching. We, at one time, we had like 50 clients and, uh, and try and match which bills. You're going to miss stuff. Now they have these services that uh, uh, you, you, you identify a bill that affects your client. I was pretty good at that. And my daughter and the other lobbyists today are good. They, they punch in which clients this affects and they find out. And every time something happens to that bill, it pops up on her screen. Wow. And then you can pull up a digest of it. And you can email it to your clients. So... The technolo so the technology. And you can get an email, you get a, and you can get a, a feedback from them immediately. You can have, you can even. We got fax machines, but they don't even need fax machines anymore. So not only is it more uh, easier, it's more efficient. Cell phones. And more productive. Cell phones. We we call them car phones in my day. They cost fifteen hundred dollars. I had one. <laughs> you couldn't get anybody unless you got to it. <laughs> Route one. <laughs> I got that hill up in South Brunswick. I was all right. Uh, you, you, uh, it, it's it's all. I guess there's more pressure. Things move faster, but but you you, you can keep abreast of a lot of things very efficiently. But there's more pressure on to do that to keep abreast because you uh, can't fall behind. To keep. You miss a you miss a you miss a bill that affects your client. You lose a good client. Oh no, it, it helps you do it. I. I I used to smoke uh, on a legislative day two, three packs of cigarettes until, until 1971 when I quit. <laughs> Sometimes I'd find myself <laughs> running around the state house with one cigarette in my mouth and another one in my hand, and I was unaware Jeez. of it. It was, it was tense. <laughs>